the omniscience of God, which means that God is all knowing. And it, and I think that's a, a, a good thing to remember about God when he's, when he's working in your life. And in my opinion now, just my observation, the, uh, it is the omniscience of God that makes Romans 8.28 believable every time under all conditions. You know, all things work together for good to those who love God. I mean, I know in my own life, those times I would, I would go like, this is, this is going to be a hard pill to swallow, this all, this all thing. I mean, you're going to have to pull the rabbit out. And, uh, and then I would think, what is it about the character of God that would make this believable? That the situation I'm in, he can, I see it as bad, but he sees it as a good. How is it possible for me to see this good before I see that it is good? Because in Romans 8, 28 is to be claimed before you see it good. I mean, it is what helps you see it good, makes you see it believable. Because always your faith has the working object of the word of God. That's what makes faith work, the character of God. But anyhow, so for me, the omniscience of God is an important aspect in the application of the word of God in your life on a lot of principles that deal with the grace of God, not just salvation, the logistical grace like Philippians 4.19. God shall supply all of your needs. And buddy, when you're down at the end of the barrel and there's no more flour, God believe something. And uh, there's a verse for you then. And what makes that believable is that is God is sovereign. And in other words, we always go back to the essence of God. Um, so for me, Understanding the character of God, the practicality of the character of God helps helps what he when he tells me something to make it believable because I know the character of God stands behind it. This is a divine decree that is essential to the operation of the faith cycle. I mean, that principle, no matter how difficult the circumstances look to the believer. And so on your paper. There's a, a walk and volition, volition being free will. And there's two circles out there. You see those two circles? These two circles are for 2 Corinthians 5, 7. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith, not by. So in one of these circles, we put sight. And in the other one, we put faith. The world system that's controlled by Satan, we call it cosmos diabolicus. That's how they operate. They operate out of sight, could be rationalism, rationalism or empiricism. You know, I, I've got to see it to believe it. I've got to touch, handle, and feel it. I've got to be emotionally connected to it. And then over here, this is, you know, this is the, the, the divine system. Right here is the divine system. God is behind that, and we call that divine viewpoint. And that's based on the word of God and the character of God. Okay. Now, here's the point. You're going to, listen, they're both called a walk. They're both called a walk, which means... Volition is involved in walk is a volitional act. Volitional act. You're either going to walk by sight or you're going to walk by faith. You're going to walk by one of them. That's just that. And listen, you're going to make decisions. Your decisions, volition, you're going to make decisions on one of those walks in your life. Your decisions are going to flow from them. And therefore, God wants you to walk by faith, not, not by sight. Agreed? You're going to walk by one or the other, but God's desire is you walk by faith. And so I wrote a bunch of that stuff on your paper in my introduction. Um, 
So we're dealing with free will, volition, called volition, because as part of the, the soul of man, volition, we call it free will. And that's what we're talking about today. And not only is it, does man have free will, but angels have free will. And we'll see it. I mean, that's where the angelic revolt came from. Free will. You can choose for or against God. Okay, well, let's, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll get into our studies tonight called the free will and the angelic conflict. Uh, classroom etiquette tells us that you can't study the Bible carnal. And, and, of course, the Bible's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. That me, by that, we mean that this person that is studying the Bible with us has b believed that Jesus died for his sins, was buried, and on the third day raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in your life and brings God's life into your life. And what a marvelous thing that is. Now, at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit indwells you and you become a spiritual person. And you should be that spiritual person. But when you're carnal, it shows that you've chosen sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sin of the tongue, avert sins. So you've committed it. How do I get back to spirituality, which is essential for Bible study, is confession of that sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, what I'm saying to my people here in the assembly hour of study I'm saying to you on the internet you need to I mean you're not going to be able to study with me with a bunch of kids running around screaming and hollering and you trying to focus you've got to get your place into a place of privacy where you can study without distractions like you would on a business call and if you're not able to do that then pick us up off the archives you can this will, be, this will come to you later by video. You can pick us up there off our internet, doctrinalstudies.com. But listen, it's important that you study so that the Holy Spirit can minister the truth. And when you confess your sins, the Holy Spirit is able to teach you, guide you, direct you, develop the word of God in your soul. All of that comes from him. So, our Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way to study with us, both by automobile and by Internet. We pray the same, cl cl same classroom etiquette that we've created here for privacy and for study. The people would have to do on their own. And it's important they do it. And if they can't acquire that, then they need to go to the archives and pick up this study later. I pray tonight, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our soul so that we could grow spiritually and that we could walk by faith, and that we could be the spiritual people we've been saved to become. Before we made our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Tonight I want to look at four aspects of the free will of man in the angelic conflict. When you walk by sight, very often, people are operating off from assumptions, not having all the facts, or off from what I hear them say, gut feelings. I'm going to tell you, they'll get you in trouble. But I do understand that principle because I lived by it by myself before I was saved. That's called sight. That's not called faith. That's called sight. Uh, the, 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 we're encouraged not to do that. Because here, if your assumption or gut feeling is wrong, you're in, you're in, now you're in a series not of one bad decision, but a whole bunch of decisions that come off a bad decision. And the first thing you know, you're in a peck of trouble or a bushel or up to your eyebrows. It depends how deep it is. So... It's important for us to understand that. And when you walk by faith, you're after this. What, what does the Bible say? And not only does it what it says maybe in one passage, but what does it say as a concept? You know, a lot of the problems that people use the Bible, and they use it all over the place. So there has to be some guidelines for you. 
For example, I'm going to give you two that you should pay attention to because people come to me all the time to say, well, pastor, my pastor believes this and that. Well, I'm not here to oppose your, what your pastor believes. I'm not here to teach your pastor. I'm not even here to argue about what he thinks. That's not my job. The Lord is the head of the, of the whole group. He's my boss. And so I'm nobody's boss. And so for me, there are two guidelines. The first guideline that is Isaiah 28.10. Scripture must back up Scripture. You can't, you can't use one Scripture to say one thing and the same subject to, on a topic, and then you look it up, and all of a sudden you read another Scripture say other things about it. So Isaiah 28.10 says that Scripture has got to back up Scripture. Text has to back up context. The context backs up the text. And uh, one scripture, the, the consent, the reason we teach categorical doctrine around here is so that you can get an overview of a subject, get a good handle on a large, like divorce or marriage or business or whatever. The Bible, there's not a, an issue in your life the Bible doesn't cover. None. That's why the Bible is such an important book. That's why the, the omniscience of God is so important and the sovereignty of God. And so that's, a, that's the first one. The second one I think is important is found in John 16, 13 and 14. I want you to go there with me. I, I think all of you know we press around here all the time. What does the Bible say and what does it say consistently about something? You don't want to find something one time that says one thing, and then all of a sudden you find out. It says, I mean, you got to look at the totality of a subject matter or a topic. Now, in John 16, at the Upper Room Discourse, in verses 13 and 14, Jesus is talking about when he's, and we're talking about this on Wednesday night, Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is part of what's going to go on with that. In verse 13, but when he, the spirit, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, look, he will guide you. This is important now. This is why you need to study the Bible and apply the Bible under the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because this is one of his responsibilities within our life because he takes up residence inside our body. Agreed? You know, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. And John 14, 16 says he can't leave. He's there forever. So one of his responsibilities, when he comes, now he's called the spirit of what? Truth. That's what we're after because truth sets you free from the cosmic system of lies. That's, that's John 8, 32. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, and he will come, he's going to come at Pentecost and he's still here from it. That's what he's talking about. He will guide you into all the truth because he's what? The spirit of truth. And truth is what sets us apart from the cosmic lies. They said, well, you ought to do this and you ought to do that. No, I mean, those might be, might be worldly suggestions, but I need to know what does God say I should do. He will guide you into all truth. Now watch. He will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. All right? That's that. Listen, that's why he's the guide. A guide says, I need somebody to get me from point A to point B. Agreed? You wouldn't hire a guide if you, right? You, you get a guide because you got to go from point A to point B. He's been sent by God to know that you need a guide in life. A guide in what? What's the subject? Truth. You need a guide in determining truth that will set you free from the cosmic lives and cause you to be able to do the things that God has designed for your life as well as the rest of us. Great? So he's a guide. He's been sent to guide you into truth. I mean, how important is that? I mean, this is why you come to Bible study is to get the truth. So that it can set you free so that you can feel at, at peace with the decisions you're making in your life. Agreed? Yeah. 
So for me, there are two, there are two polar ideas for me in the Word of God. Isaiah 28.10 and John, uh, I, I did, verse 14 goes on to say, He shall glorify me for, talking about the Holy Spirit, for he shall take of mine and disclose it to you. See, he's used the word disclosed twice. He's using that word, disclose. Well, that's part of guidance. That's part of his guidance. Um, while I'm in John, uh, I, I know the, the, the stuff, this stuff is not on your paper. By now you know that, right? Now I'm winging and you need to be right. Okay. I want to slide over to John 17 a moment. Uh, no, back up to 717. Uh, 7, I hope that's right. I wrote this down just flying. Yeah, it's 717. In verse 16, Jesus said, there, he says to them, he says, my teaching is not mine, but he who sent me, my teaching. If any man is willing to do God's will, see, that's a capital H. He shall know of the teaching, whether it is from God or whether I speak from within myself. See there? The last thing you need to do is to click into human wisdom to think that that's going to guide you in the plan of God. See, that's 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3. 1 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, and 3. Now, I want you to go to Matthew with me now, because I want to jump in here now. I want to get into Matthew, uh, my text, at the top of your paper. I'm in, I'm in chapter 21, and I'm in verses 28 through 32. I'm in 21. <clears throat> you see, did you happen to see the other day, while well, you're turning, you happen to see the other night where... Somebody found a Bible with the name Ron Adama on it. It was all over Facebook. <clears throat> and uh, people started calling all my family members. You know, not many Adamas here in Alabama. And, um, and then other people started calling. And here was his Bible, and the Bible was uh, in front, was found in a parking lot in Trustful at Publix. Uh, in, in trustful over there. So my my girls, of course, jumped on that right away and secured that Bible. Uh, they sent their husbands out to get it. And uh, I couldn't imagine how that Bible, and they posted it. When they found it, they posted it for me. And it looked just like the Bible I have upstairs on my pulpit that I leave there. I went, how did that Bible from my pulpit get out there? Well, um, Rick, my son-in-law, secured it, brought it to me immediately. Uh, like, that's the only Bible I have. <laughs> if you find a Bible with only one, if you find a preacher with only one Bible, he has just started in the business. Um, and somebody probably gave it to him. Uh, but it was a Bible from a long time ago. And I, for the life of me, I can't remember. I gave it somebody. You know, I, I was giving Bibles away every time somebody was out like, oh, I have a Bible, I'm going, well, here. And then, but I usually wrote in them, and I didn't write in this Bible. But anyhow, they found this Bible, and I looked at the Bible, and I went, boy, that Bible I don't know when I gave that Bible away, but that's been a long time ago. Isn't that funny how that Bible showed up? So I'm waiting on somebody that lost the Bible with my name on it to contact me because I have it. And if you want it, you can have it if it belongs to you. Well, anyhow, here I am. Now we're, we're all there. We're at chapter 21. We're looking at verse 28. He says, but what do you think? That's a question. Agreed? But, it, but to understand this, you're going to have to go back to verse 23 because the religious leadership described as from, sent from the temple, the chief priests and the elders, 
they've came and they and they've they've come to to ask just by what authority do you have to go around saying the things you are and doing the things you are? We didn't give you, I mean, you don't have any credentials. You haven't gone to the finest schools. You haven't, you, we haven't written off on you. Where do you get going around and doing these things? Okay. Who gave you this authority, they asked. Jesus answered and said to them, verse 24, let me ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Boy, was he a, was he a master of words? The baptism of John was, what was the source? From heaven or from men? Oh, wow, they thought. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why don't you believe him? If we say from men, we fear the multitude, for they all believe John to be a prophet. That's a national prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, we don't know. Isn't that a, isn't that a kid? Isn't that, why'd you do that, son? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. Which means I don't want to talk about it. Which means... Oh, we're going to talk about it. There's a fender missing from my car. Of course, we're going to talk about it. He said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now we're at my place. But what do you think? And he gives him a parable. Boy, this is the power. Now, listen. Parents who raise little children live off from parables, right? Angie thought she's got this little wise guy, Ben. So she's always trying to get one up on him. So he was wanting to know about what the, where they were going, what they were going to do, and she said, you know that yesterday's tomorrow's today. He said, yeah, at Easter. <laughs> <laughs> she went, done. I mean, where'd that come from? I mean, he did it. He thought for just a moment, looked at her and said, it's Easter. So how do you, I mean, there's a kid. I said to her, do you have any idea what this is going to mean when he's able to get you at four? I mean, you shut the book, and he's at four. He went in his bedroom, probably went, yeah. Isn't that cute? Well, one day you'll have grandkids. Uh, a man had two sons. You know this par parable. He went to the first. His son, go work today in the vineyard. He answered and said, I will, sir. And he didn't go. He came to the second son. He said the same thing. He answered him, I will not. Oh, and the, wait, in verse 29, I will, sir, but didn't do it. He came to the second son, said the same thing. The son said, I will not. Yet afterwards, he regretted, and he did it. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the latter. Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, you know what that is? See, that's one of those truly, truly, I say unto you. This is in Matthew. They didn't double it up. John was the only one that ever told you that secret. This is a messy, any doctrine. Truly, I say to you, watch this, watch this messianic doctrine now. The tax gatherers and the harlots will go into the kingdom of God before you. Do you know the answer? Why? Why that's true? They won't, they won't do the Father's will, will they? Okay. John came preaching Jesus. They threw John out under the bus and they're going to throw him. John came to you and he's going to tell you. John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. The tax collector in his heart of it did believe him. You can see who his congregation was made up of. And you seeing this, 
did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe him. See that same word, regret? You know, in verse 30, yet afterwards regretted and went. You saw all this happen under John, and yet you saw it and saw the results. See, and what is this? Listen, it's free will. This whole parable is about free will. Do you see that? Listen to me. The whole thing is about the will. <laughs> right? The will, the will, the will, the will. That's why I chose it. I chose that. I chose that. Here's the first point. The omniscience of God took in consideration the free will of both mankind and angels when he did the master plan of God. We know that because of, for example, Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 talks about greater is Christ than angels. And he goes into this whole discussion in Hebrews 2. However, you and I both know the angelic revolt in eternity past. An uprising is an opposition of wills. I mean, you can have it in your own house. Your kids, your mate. The angelic revolt in eternity past shows angelic volition or free will acting against the sovereign will of God. When you read Isaiah, there are three passages. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, you're going to hear the will, you're going to hear the words five times, I will. And it's very important that when you study, you pay attention to that. In Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19, you're going to see the words, we were. It is used five times, and then there's going to be a consequence to it in verses 16 through 18, you should pay attention to. The third reference is in Revelation 21, one through, uh, Revelation 12, uh, 1 through 17, where the concept of the dragon, which is the ancient serpent, the devil or Satan, described that way in Revelation 20, this phrase is used nine times of rebellion. Now, how do you get rebellion if you don't have free will? What are you opposing? Jesus himself, as deity in humanity, had to submit his volition to the will of the Father. He, tell, he told you that in Matthew 26, 39. Not my will, but thy will be done. We saw this in the garden with Adam and Eve. Free will, volition. Once the master plan was revealed at the eternal life conference, in eternity past, at the eternal life conference, Satan led an angelic revolt against it, and he has been revolting against it ever since. All the way from Genesis, with the appearance of the human race, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, he's in rebellion against it. You know why? The centerpiece of the master plan of God was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the, master, it's the centerpiece of the whole master plan. And we know it because that's what he's fought. It was declared in Genesis 3.15, and he's fought it all the way. I mean, why, did, why do you suppose he tried to kill all the, the Bethlehem children? I mean, what, what was his intent? What was his motive? What was he after? When you read Revelation 12 about him, you can see that he has fought it all the way through human history. Now we're at the end. When you're in Revelation 12, we're at the end. You and I are in the last days. Here's another clue. In Matthew, this not in your paper, but in Matthew, I don't think I wrote it, but in Matthew 4, 8 through 11, Jesus is ready to go into his earthly ministry to go to the cross. 
enter his ministry to go to the cross. That's, that was his mission, wasn't it? And he has this great combat with the devil, open, open conflict, conflict with the devil, right? I mean, we're, we're, this is being replayed again from eternity past is being replayed again and is replayed over and over and over again all the way to the end of the time when Satan is cast in the lake fire. This same warfare. This is the warfare that you and I fight with the devil too. Be, be aware of this. Matthew, the fourth chapter, in verse, you know, he, fight, he, he, he fights him three times, right? Goes three rounds. The last round was really important when he makes this great offer and he says, I'll give you the kingdoms and all that if you'll do what? Fall down and worship me. See, that's the deal. That's what happened in eternity past. That's what the warfare is about. And, and who you will consent volitionally to worship. And listen, you'll either worship him or you'll worship God. If you worship God, you have to go through Christ. No man comes to the Father except through me. Only with God can you worship in uh, spirit and truth. That's what the warfare is about. In Philippians, listen, here's the other part of it. Matthew 4 is the first part, 8 through 11. But here's the second part. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. In Philippians 2, 10, 11, a, a phrase that you're all familiar with but may not attach it to the angelic conflict, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's the centerpiece of the master plan of God that caused this revolt in eternity past. How do I know that? Because it's the same conflict going on, man. This is his agenda. If you pay attention to warfare, here's the second point. So free will is a big deal. I want people to tell you that you don't have free will. Because free will can speak when people are telling you you don't have free will. You're going like, yes, I do. And that proves you do. I used to say, and nobody has it anymore, I used to say, if you don't believe in free will, give me your watch. You don't need that watch, I'll take it. I mean, what kind of appointment you got? You know, nobody ever gave me their watch. They gave me advice, they didn't give me the watch. How bad is that? You don't need a watch. Here's the second point. God designed the master plan of God for free will, volition, the free will of mankind to be able to choose to act dependent or independent of his revealed sovereign will. Because that's the key to the angelic conflict. That's why this whole deal is going on. There is the, you go like, well, why is there this warfare? There it is. The fall of Adam, the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden shows volition or free will acting both for and against. Now, people often miss this. It, it, it worked in the Garden of Eden. It worked for as well as against the revealed sovereign will of God. How do I know that? Well, look, the free will of, of Adam and Eve showed up and they went to Bible study. At Bible study, they learned, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the day eating from it, dying you will die. Where'd they learn that? Bible study. In the cool of the day, in the cool of the day, they met and the Lord taught Bible study. He taught them a whole lot of things. That was one of them. And so volition was, they showed up to Bible study, they learned and got it, right? They knew what he meant and they, they knew that. He, they had been taught it. They didn't know it experientially, but they knew it theologically. And what you're supposed to walk by faith is in the Word of God, right? You walk in the Word of God, okay? That's the, how this whole thing works in your life. It's not about, I, I'm not going to believe it, I don't see it. See, a lot of people get discouraged with prayer because... They want it on their schedule, on their whole demand. They don't get it when they expect, I prayed it, I should be getting it. I haven't got it. You know, when I was a little kid, I would send out for Tom Mix rings. It, it, it was a radio guy, cowboy on radio. And they, if you got these Wheaties, you could take the top 
and mail it in, and they would give you these signal rings and things, uh, you know, these little plastic things. And I lived off that stuff. Just shows how goofy we are. I mean, it never was anything but a way to get me to buy a box of cereal, get my mother to buy a box of cereal, so I had at the top of it, whether I liked the cereal or not, I had to, with my mother, you better like that cereal. You better like it, because you won't eat it. Well, anyhow, the fall, is, so we got it for, so they use their volition to go to Bible study, they use their volition to learn it and study it and get it. Then they use their volition to turn against it, right? Because they, they, did they eat of the tree? Yes, yes they did. So we know that story, but see, a lot of times we pay attention to, the, to the, them working against it and not for it, right? But listen, they were on both sides of this. When they ate of it, the Lord had to, he asked them uh, every kind of question in the whole wide world. They wouldn't give him an answer. And finally he said, did you eat from the tree? Well, I mean, you know, they probably, you could probably, he could probably smell it and see it. But of course, being God, he knew it. You and I, we'd had to play detective. Let me smile your breath, son. Mother, I'm, I'm 16. I don't care. You drove my car. Let me smile your breath. The sovereign will of God was revealed to Adam and Eve in Genesis 2.17, for in that day, and as soon as that is brought into, now listen to me, as soon as that's brought in volitionally into their soul as truth, he launches an attack upon it. Isn't that interesting? See, you don't have to launch an attack in your life about what's not. If you believe lies, he's got you. It's when you embrace truth that he gets after you, right? Yeah, all that, well, pfft. So he launches an attack against the revealed sovereign will of God in the lives of Adam and Eve as truth. You see, and that's part of the angelic act. Can God get a person who has studied the Bible, believes it to be the truth of God, can he get him to turn against it? That's a hoo See, that's one touchdown. In the game of life, I just score. You understand that? This is how, listen, he worked this, this old plan worked in the garden. He's been working it ever since. You either have truth or lies. If you have lies, he's got you. It's when you get the truth that he has to get after you. And he's got to show you that the truth isn't the truth. Get back here where you belong and get into the lie pen. What you doing walking around like a free person? What you doing believing this God stuff? Get back over here where you belong. Yeah, he don't say it that way because he's an angel. He disguises himself as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11. So he launches this attack against you as soon as you, listen, once you show up here and get into Bible study and begin to study and get truth in there and you go like, whoa, wow, 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 wow. Watch out. Because now the game starts. Now you get attacked about what you believe to be true. Sometimes it's, it's really in-house. Sometimes it's in-house. Sometimes it's out-house. It don't matter. He doesn't have to attack lies. He has to attack truth. You understand that, don't you? Oh, thank you. All right. 2 Corinthians 11.3. You ought to have it down there. And you know what he's after? Listen to me. You know what 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 3, how he got Eve? Paul says, beware, be, watch out now. I'm going to tell you how he got Eve. He got her mind. He targets your mind, what you think and believe. See, if he can get to your, if he can get to your mind, he can get to your heart. That's, a, that's, the, first, that's the first stop. So he starts with her mind, doesn't he? Well, Eve, let see, see where you're going to Bible study. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Works on that to get her to change her, her heart. You understand? 
Ah, you need to go back and read it. Volition. You know, you know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians eleven three 3 about Eve? It said, her mind was led astray. Her mind was led astray. Now watch this. From something to something. What was it led astray from? When you read that, from the pure devotion to Christ. Pure devotion to Christ. I mean, a heart that was sold out to God, he got a hold of. Think about that. I mean, we're, I mean, he starts with your mind. Well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And you go, like, oh, that's a possibility. And rather than go like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What's the word of God say? You see, when he did that with Jesus, Jesus immediately pulled scripture out on him. Jesus immediately went, what's the Bible say? And when he got it, he pulled out a scripture and went, boom. And it went, oh, wow. And so he, the second round, he attacks his mind. He's going, well, what about this? And Jesus said, what's the word of God say? Boom, there it is. Pulls out the scripture. Boom, puts them on him. Devil goes, oh, wow. That's the way it works. You, you, and you can always tell. Your mind is over here, and you go like, you go like, what's the Bible say? Listen to me. Now, listen to me. As soon as you say, what's the Bible say? The Holy Spirit of God, if you're a spiritual person, he immediately puts the truth into your soul, and now you're in conflict because your mind was thinking, I'm going to go a different way. And you wait, and you go, listen, the Holy Spirit said, what's the Bible say? He whispers in your spirit, what's the Bible say? It pops in your mind, what's the Bible say? And you immediately go, what's the Bible say? Immediately, the word of God comes up. It's as clear as a bell. And now, you see, you're in conflict. With the truth versus a lie. See, he, he tried to lie you. See? He, try, he tried to hook you with lying. Well, what about the, oh, you poor, you poor thing. Oh, you poor thing. You probably do. Oh, you poor thing. Well, don't you let them do. You come here. Don't let me talk to you. Listen, that, that goofiness gets in that, comes into that mind you got to say, what's the Bible say? And as soon as you do it, a spiritual person is always going to say, wait a minute, that's, I don't think that's true. Wait a minute, I'm not going to go there. Wait a minute, whoa, what's the Bible say? And it'll go like, hmm, right? Imagine life, David's life would have been much better when that sitting up there, uh, uh, looking out there at a woman bathing naked and, and, and his mind goes off. <gasps> and he says, whoa, 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 what's the word of God say? You understand? His life would have been completely different, right? A whole episode of his life that just went into the toilet would have been different. And here was a man that knew that and still got suckered. And who am I to pick on David? It's just, he's in the Bible and I'm not. Listen. Listen. Adam's first death experience, his first death experience was spiritual in time with God. Genesis 3, 8 through 13. His second death experience was physical 930 years after he sinned and recovered. Now think about that. And so it goes. We are born into Adam's sin. We are spiritually dead, separated from God in time. You have an opportunity from that point to death to make a good, clear decision like Adam did to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, just like Abraham did in Galatians, the third chapter, verse 8. A prophetic idea. That, that one day the Messiah would come, die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead third day. All of that's prophetic. Pretty good stuff, too. You say to me, and I, I, I get this every once in a while, how do you know he was saved? What, what, what evidence do you have in the book of Genesis or anywhere else in the Bible that he was saved? See, you wouldn't probably get those questions, but I get them because I'm on the Internet through this little Bible study. Well, Genesis 3.21, God covered him, right? Found him, he was naked, and then covered him. They said, yeah, but what's that mean? I'll tell you. 
Here for me is the proof in the pudding. I grew up with proof in the pudding. Do you like my pudding? Well, let me taste it. Here it is. Here, here, here for me it is. Luke, third chapter, verse 38. There it is. You know what it says? In the genealogy of Jesus Christ, it's God, Adam, Seth, and it rolls all the way up to Jesus. You know what that was? That was the old covenant book of life that you got to peek at. It's a peek into the Old Covenant book of life. Point three. God doesn't oppose free will when it acts independent of his sovereign will. He doesn't oppose it. We call it the permissive will. When his revealed will I call it the directive will. When the revealed directive will is given to you, he allows you volitionally to choose for or against it. Once that decision is made, however, I wrote this at point three, but once a choice free will is made, the predetermined decree and the master plan of God is applied to cause and effect and consequences of the transgression of it. You can bank that on. You study the Bible from point to point A, point B, point C, point D, all the way to X, Y, and Z. It's what you're going to learn. For example, with, with Adam and Eve in Genesis 2.17, the Lord says to Adam and Eve, don't eat of the tree. Then he allows free will to act. This is part of the angelic conflict. The permissive will, Satan comes to Adam and Eve and uh, gives them an option. That's called the angelic conflict. When they choose that, then there's a whole nother game in town. And that's the overruling will of God, which deals with cause and effect and consequences. Cause, effect, and consequences. You want to remember that because it's going to roll down the hill on you. This is snowball. The farther it rolls down, the more speed it gets and the bigger it gets. The overrule of will, will of God. In other words, there's a cause and effect. Did they eat from it? Yes. Did God's word go into effect? Now he, this has to work upon their life, right? The cause and effect. And was there consequences to it? Listen, here's the consequences to that. And sometimes the consequences are beyond your life. The consequences spread to the entire human race. Think about that. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 12 through 21 says... The, the consequences to Adam's sin became my fall. How about that? Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death spread to all mankind. Or, as the, another version says, was passed on to all mankind. How about that? Cause and effect. How about David's sin with Bathsheba? I think maybe, no, I didn't. Yeah, I did. I, it's your home study. In your home study on the bottom of your paper, I want you to go in and take a look at that and study that, the cause, effect, and consequences. I mean, this was, this was so uh, far out in the plan of God when David did that, that God sent Nathan in there and put him under the, death of, the sin unto death, right? If you know that story, you know that's true. David confessed his sin. And got out from under the sin unto death. But there were still consequences to his act. Because it was an attack. Satan d did that with him to attack the royal seed of Christ. That baby was the royal seed of Christ. It was for all practical purposes to be. And he couldn't, ha couldn't be that way out of adultery. So the baby had to die. That's the other part of the plan of God, and it's another part of the story of babies and the omniscient or, or providence of God. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's always a recovery part of the will. There's always a recovery. Listen, it's never too late to come back to God. It's never too late to clean your life up. It's never too late to get back. It is never too late. 
when I used to work with the Jimmy Hill Mission and these, uh, these kind of programs out there, Mr. Farmer, I used to do it. I had to do it through my theology training. And then Mr. Farmer come along, started dragging me back to all these places again. It was hard for a lot of these people to ever believe that, they're, that they could get another start. And I meet guys, for example, at the Salvation Army Retention Center, their rehab program over there. I'd meet guys that had been through their rehab, their rehabbing program nine times. It wasn't uncommon to see guys in there seven, seven to nine times and go like, I, I just. And, and they played you like a fiddle. I mean, they had no, they played you like a fiddle until you really got to know it. You had to learn to let them play and you not dance. But anyhow, recovery, recovery is, recovery is all there. Like, you know, we say as long as you have Nisha Mahaim, as long as you have the breath of God in your body, God, the, everything is still up for grabs for you. You can get back in the whole program. Got to get you back in the program. And listen, we know that from the book of Jonah. We know that. We know it from so many others. Or we know it from the life of David. I mean, we just know it from all over the scriptures. We know it from the life of Peter, and we could just go on and on and on. Listen, also, here's a, here's a point, and I'm going to close with this. I've got down there the recovery of the directive will. I, I say to you in Genesis 3.15, 3, he gives a messianic prophecy. We all know about the Genesis 3.15, the, the seed of the woman. But here's what's often missed in that, and that you and I are engaged in. As part of the seed of the woman of Christ. We're part of the seed of the woman Christ. Do you know what? When we came into the Lord Jesus Christ. In the angelic conflict. We have the tag on us of enmity. Now we have it through Adam. But we also have it through the conflict. When you study Genesis 3.15. You're going to see there is enmity. Perpetual enmity. Watch this now. Not, not just between the woman and Satan, but through the seed of Satan and the seed of the woman, there is going to be enmity. And that's the key behind the angelic conflict. That's one of them. You can read about it in Ephesians 2, 13 through 16. Okay? That Matthew 13, 39 shows you how Satan attacks the word of God when it's truth in your life. Once it's sown and becomes truth in your life, that's what he attacks. Okay? All right. Free will. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll enter into our personal prayer. This lets us sign off with our Internet people. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us on the subject of the free will in the angelic conflict. We pray, Father, we've been able to touch some of the highlights of it. This is a subject, Father, that cannot be covered thoroughly in one study. So we've introduced it with some concepts. I pray tonight, Father, that those who are, are with us in this lesson uh, here in our study would go and study this. In my opinion, studies like this have to be heard and studied at least three times in order for it to sink in, for you to really get an understanding, to look up the scriptures and read them and, and think about them and mull over them, understand them. So I pray for that, not only for those that are with us here, but those who are on the Internet when you're dealing with some basic doctrines, they've got to be heard and heard and heard and heard again. Because each time you're going to be brought into a new concept or a new idea or a, a new view of that subject matter that's important to your faith. So we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.